we're at Nan, and about a week ago, we made a video walkthrough of our Italian farmhouse. And we got a lot of nice comp compliments and also a lot of questions about some of the decisions we made. So we thought we'd make another video talking about what options we had and why we made the decisions that we did. So I hope that you find this interesting and might help you if you're thinking about buying or particularly building a house in Italy. So come along with us and we'll just walk around the house and talk about what we did. Yeah, this is not going to be a tightly produced video. <laughs> no, I, not I, at all. I'll, I'll warn you right now. Perhaps a bit more rambly. Yes. But we, but... Hope, we hope that doesn't get in the way of your enjoyment. Okay. From the beginning, we knew that we wanted the house to look old. We wanted it to look like it had been here for a hundred years. And because that was important to us, that informed a lot of the decisions we made about the exterior of the house. The first decision we had to make was, what material did we want on the outside of the house? Did we want it to be stucco, rendered stucco, or did we want it to be stone? I think it was pretty clear we wanted stone for one reason, Anne was adamant when she saw a rendered house that that was no, no, no. Well, I mean, I, I figured that if we're going to have an old house, let's really go for it. Um, it was going to be less expensive to do a rendered house. And what that just means is that instead of being painted, the stucco has the, the coloring mixed in with the stucco and then applied to the house. And, and that can look fine, but I just had this vision of a stone country house. When it came to designing our front door, we really wanted something that was classic Italian, not too ornate, but something that really fit again with a country house. And we actually went all over and looked at front doors and took pictures of them until we found some elements that we liked. And then we designed our own front door with this knocker and this uh, pull. You may have noticed at Anne's feet, there's what looks like a sidewalk next to the house. And in fact, that's what it is. It's called a marciapiede, which is the Italian word for sidewalk. And it's, it's very common here. And Anne thought when we first built the house that we should have bushes next to the house. And we were told, no, 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 no. This is the way it's done uh, in Marque. For one reason, it prevents water infiltration, but it's also just the style. So we went along with it. Another thing we did is we went to a salvage yard to try to find some interesting pieces for decorations on the house. And some of what we found were these, these plates for the spigots. And then the spigots themselves are actually new, but they look like they're, they're older. And we have four of these around the house. And we thought that this provided a nice little touch that uh, added a little element to, yeah. to the house itself. And if you can't tell, this is actually a lion head. Um, and then this is some sort of animal with the water coming out of its mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Let me move around the house a little bit. If you come over here, you'll see sort of a mini house. This is our wood store. And again, this is important for us to make it look like not only part of the house, but part of the, um, the countryside. And here's a good place where you can see the older tiles up on top of newer tiles forming that roof that looks older. And this is a lot of wood since we're not here much in the winter. That's true. A lot of wood. I think most of this wood's been here for a couple, three years, something like that. Let's go around to the back of the house and we'll look at some of the other decorative elements and functional elements that we put here. One of the first ones was these things called dove coats, which we saw in other houses and in fact are very traditional. They go back to the Middle Ages in Europe and the idea was to encourage pigeons and doves to nest here because they then used the eggs uh, and the dung of the birds and ate the birds. So it was a way to sort of provide a birdhouse that was functional for the family that lived here. Of course, these days we haven't had any doves uh, nest there. For one thing, this faces west and they would be baked. <laughs> Also, I, I would point out that they use the dung as fertilizer, just if you were wondering <laughs> what on earth they could possibly <laughs> use fertilizer, or they could possibly use dung for. Right. Moving further along the back of the house, we built this little fountain using a back plate from that salvage yard. 
an old piece of stone and then had the base built. And this gives us a way to have a nice sound of water while we're sitting outside relaxing or enjoying the view. One of the more functional design elements on the back of the house was, of course, this portico. This is absolutely key. I mean, here we have this amazing view of the mountains and the valley. And so obviously we want to sit out here and enjoy it. So we eat a lot of our meals out here when the weather is nice. And we also sit out here and read or have an aperitivo. I mean, this is kind of where we live when the weather is nice. The last thing we bought at the salvage yard was this cute little farm sink. And uh, we bought the sink and then we, we put it on these brick, this brick base. And we use it all the time and we clean gardening things and we clean the grill and we, you know, pot, pot our plants and just use it for all sorts of things. It's just nice to have it on the outside. And actually when we put, put the stopper in and run the water, the birds use it as a bird bath. <laughs> it's a nice uh, additional use. Yeah. Shall we go inside? Let's go inside. One thing we realized was without any windows, the front hall was going to be very dark. So what we decided to do is put a lunette over the front doorway to add some light to the hallway. Now let's talk about the floor tiles. So originally we thought of getting old floor tiles, you know, those red terracotta floor tiles. And, but we were advised not to use old tiles because they're very porous. Um, they're not as hardy or robust and they're a little bit harder to maintain. And, and we were going to use underfloor heating and it wasn't quite as easy to do ah, the underfloor that's right. heating that way. Our whole heating system is under the floor and that was going to make it more challenging. So anyway, we got some tiles that are new but sort of have that old tile feel. And what we did was we, we laid them in kind of a semi-random pattern. So you'll see that, you know, some of them are going this way. You've got, it, there's, it's not a super regular pattern. As, the, as our floor guy said it, we laid the floor a caso, which means kind of at random. Um, and we think it gives a nice kind of farmhouse look. Let's move uh, into the living room and talk about the, uh, the ceiling choice because we made a different ceiling choice here than we did upstairs. So um, when we talk about the beams, um, these are chestnut beams that you find in many old houses. They are structural. They're holding up the second floor and they have the cross beams. And in between, you'll see that it's painted white. And that's different than what we have upstairs, which is we have the terracotta tiles between the beams. But in this case, because the ceiling's not super high in here, we thought it would keep it more light if we had painted them white. And then you'll see when we go upstairs, we have very high ceilings. And so we went ahead with the traditional method of having the, um, the terracotta tiles not painted white. Yeah, both of these are traditional. This is, a, the terracotta is a little more traditional, but you'll certainly see a lot of uh, original ho houses that have the the uh, the white uh, between the beams. So you'll notice that we have this one wall that's stone, um, and the rest of it is you know stucco or whatever. And um, these are the stones from the ruin. So when we bought this property, there was a ruin on it, and obviously a lot of stones that that house was made out of. So we took those stones and we built this wall with them so that we could keep part of the old house in our house. So let's talk about the fireplace next. Now, we wanted a fireplace that could be seen throughout the whole room. So the sitting area, the dining room, and the living room. So the obvious choice was to put it here in the corner, and that way it could be enjoyed from all over. And we were actually advised to put in a pellet stove that that would be much more efficient from a heating standpoint. And that's true, and we probably should have done that. But anyway, I had a vision about an old-fashioned fireplace, and so that's what we built here. When we were outside, we talked about wanting the house to live new, even though it looked old. And I think that's really represented by this room, uh, the modern fixtures, the open space, and you can see that we put in modern uh, 
pretty high end, probably too high end appliances and, and other fixtures, but it, uh, it makes it a really livable house and one that we like to be at. Especially with an island and a lot of storage, which most, you know, I think most Italian, or at least most old Italian houses mm -hmm. don't have a lot of storage. I think new ones do more. Um, and then, of course, we have the big fridge on the right and the big freezer on the left, which has nothing in it but ice. Nothing in it but ice. And then we have, of course, a wine fridge because we, we do go on frequent trips to wineries. And when we go to wine tastings, of course, we end up buying wine. Right. So we've got quite a good supply. Now we're in the master bedroom. And one of the elements that I wanted was a walk-in closet. And that's because I didn't have a walk-in closet in our house in the United States. And I was having walk-in closet envy. <laughs> so I asked the builder to build in a walk-in closet. And of course, he looked at me like I had three heads. Because not only aren't walk-in closets a thing, but closets aren't a thing. Typically in Italy, people just have wardrobes, you know, standalone pieces of furniture that are wardrobes. And uh, in fact, today what most people do is they go down to Ikea and they buy something like this. This is three units put together and it actually works great. Um, and I'm not going to show you the messy inside of it, um, but it turns out they were right. A walk-in closet would have taken up half the room yes. or more. So, I would have been sleeping on a one inch side of a twin bed if we had put the <laughs> walk-in right. closet here that was actually right. originally drawn. It really did take up most of the room. I will say that when we moved to a new house in the United States, I did get my walk-in closet finally. Let's address the bidet issue. Now, every good Italian house has a bidet in every room, <laughs> in every bathroom. However, we chose not to put in bidets because, frankly, we just didn't want to take up all the space in the bathroom with a bidet. Um, so I'm sure that any Italian watching this was probably horrified. Um, and I think somebody even said in the comments, no Italian's ever going to buy your house if you try to sell it, it's which is true. true. It's true. But I actually think the people who are most likely going to buy this house, if and when we sell it, are going to be Americans, Brits, Dutch, Germans. Um, I don't think the Italians would have much interest in this house. Um, so what we did instead... Why don't we go show what we did Well, let's instead. do go show what they, we did. So here was our compromise for not having a bidet. We have this little sprayer doohickey, which is called a what? Telefonino, apparently. A telefonino, like a telephone. It means a little telephone. A little telephone. Um, and this serves the purpose of a bidet, but you just use it while you're sitting on the toilet <laughs> instead of sitting on the bidet. Instead of sitting on the bidet. That's so right. hopefully that compromise will work mm -hmm. for other people too. We talked a lot about the design elements in the house, and I've acted like I had something to do with them. I really had more to do with some of the functionality, and some of those things turned out to then be things that are eh, that attractive. Having good internet here was really important, and because it's a reinforced concrete house with stone walls, we needed to make sure that the internet wasn't going to get just blocked in one room. So we put in three of these large access points throughout the house. And it provides a really good connection every place here and even quite a ways outside. The second functional thing that I wanted was in general in Italy, people don't use air conditioning because electricity is amazingly expensive. So we were going to go with ceiling fans as we did in every room, but thought maybe it's going to get too hot for us really to sleep at night. So in all the bedrooms, we put in a little port where you could attach a portable air conditioner to it and use that as the exhaust. Uh, and, and the air conditioners would be, could be moved around. Could be moved so around. you could use it in this room as you're sleeping, but put it in the living room or another room at another time of day, right? Right. The uh, sad part of this story is that the one we had here turned out to be stolen by somebody working on the house very soon after we put it in. And we've never, because of fear of that happening again, have never reinstalled it. But if we're here in the hot summer one time when it's really hot, 
like uh, I know the one of the years we were building the house, it got to 110 here. We'll probably need to go out and buy some of these units. Here's a feature that we added in, which were these niches. We put it in this office and we also put it in each of the bathrooms. Um, and it's kind of a nice old fashioned touch, which is very practical because it allows us to, you know, put books and pictures and other things. Um, it's also over. something that we saw in other houses. As you can tell, we stole a lot of ideas from the houses we looked at and didn't buy. We're not proud. No. <laughs> Um, one of the things you'll notice is that we changed floors. We have, we don't have the tile, you know, the typical terracotta floor up here. Instead we have, uh, it is tile, but it looks like wood. And we just thought that that would be a nice change and it would feel warmer and cozier than terracotta tile. So we, we put this kind of floor in. And then when it comes to the ceilings, you'll see that we don't have the white ceiling, um, but we have the traditional terracotta tiles between the beams. And with such a high ceiling, you know, we didn't have to worry about it being dark or closed in feeling. So we decided to go ahead with this traditional look. So in the second floor bathroom, we actually had a fair amount of space to work with. And so we put a tub and a shower. And unlike most Italian showers, which are kind of teeny tiny boxes, we actually have a walk-in shower that's, that's actually quite spacious. And then we have a separate bathtub because we figured anybody who comes to visit us who has young children, you know, typically young children take a bath instead of a shower. So we thought that it would be a nice touch to have that available. Our whole house is heated by underfloor radiant heating. But in the bathrooms, we also have these towel warmer heaters that, you know, they do double duty. They'll keep the, you can hang your towels on them and dry the towels. But they also, when you turn them on, they're like a radiator. They give off heat. And so in the winter, uh, when you want it to be a little extra warm in the bathroom, you just turn these on and these together with the underfloor heating make it really nice and toasty. We're outside again and I figured we'd finish off talking a little bit about some of our landscaping challenges. So our property turned out not to be the gently sloping meadow that we thought it was. In fact, it's quite steep. And once we sort of dug out a flat area for the house, it left a very steep hill in front of the house that we had to contend with. And we ended up having to build, I think there's sort of three terraces um, up the hill so that we could actually plant stuff and also not have, and also not have just everything run off in a, in a rainstorm. And when we planted this, and I'll, I'll insert some pictures, everything looked nice. It was evenly spaced out and everything was the same size and it looked very awesome. Um, but of course, all the plants grew at different <laughs> rates. Some of them didn't thrive at all in this climate. Um, even though we have irrigation, it gets so hot here in the summer and the soil is so bad that a lot of plants just didn't make it. And that's why we have some gaps here. But other plants just took off and, you know, basically are taking over. And unfortunately, I don't know the names of most of these things. I mean, we have a lot of rosemary. Rosemary loves Rosemary it. Rosemary loves it here. Uh, we have laurel everywhere. Uh, what else? That's, I think, Russian sage, lavender. We have roses, um, euonymus, a butterfly bush, some viburnum. Uh, I can't remember what those ones up there with the little yellow flowers up by the top of the stairs. Mm. But at any rate, um, this has been a challenge. And we've had to replace some things, and then things don't live, and whatever. Anyway, um, it's, uh, I like a casual look in my landscaping. Maybe this is a little bit more casual than I was going for, <laughs> but whatever, it works. Um, over time, we'll get it where we want it to be. That's right. That's for sure. You know, one thing that does grow very well around here in the dry, poor soil are olives. 
Uh, it's right around us for that reason. There's not as much wine produced as there is olive oil. Yeah, lots more olive oil. And also sunflowers love it here. Yes. And in the summer, in July and August, just fields and fields and fields of sunflowers that are absolutely gorgeous. Um, and they make oil out of those too. I mean, that's why they're growing them. Mm -hmm. So in Italy, don't bring someone sunflowers as a hostess gift because they'll be kind of insulted. It's like bringing somebody Clover, a weed or, or dandelion or uh, a bundle of wheat or something <laughs> <laughs> just like it's just not done uh, even though in the states we love some sunflowers right so that's it for the details of our little italian farmhouse and how we decided to do what we did when we built it and we hope we haven't raised more questions <laughs> than we've answered but in case we did just put them in the comments below and we'll do our best to answer them if you haven't seen the first video, we'll link it up on screen. But thanks for watching this far, this far through the video, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Ciao for now. Ciao.